Well, I'm going to start us off kind of looking at considerations for breeding new lambs. I mean, there's a few considerations about why would you do it in the first place? I suppose there's quite, there is a few options really, but it's all about trying to get more output um, in your sheep system. So getting an additional lamb from stock that would not otherwise be rearing, you know, anything, you know, they'd just be a, a kind of a, a, an unproductive group of, of stock. Um, although you can run them on slightly tighter, uh, lower feed demands. Um, this does give you the opportunity to increase output for potentially little additional input if on a forage based system. So if we can do that without excessive uses of kind of concentrates and other inputs. Um, it gives us the opportunity to increase lifetime production. So if well managed, we're getting another lamb out of a, out of a hog um, and hopefully not impacting that future performance or that you know, longevity in that stock. But it's all about having stock at uh, meeting target weights and then managing them appropriately to, to achieve that. And um, we can also make more from summer pasture. So when we have that kind of supply and demand, we have excess growth in the spring, we're better able to use that. We've got more mouths on the ground. But likewise, we still be giving that ewe lamb. So we might necess not necessarily have more demand otherwise at other sides of the seasons. Um, and it also gives us the opportunity to select for fertility. So quite often what we might do, if we consider we might be kind of scanning at 100% in hogs with maybe a 85% conception rate, what we might do then is decide that we'll, we'll top 20% more hogs and come, come scanning time, we would then call out maybe that 20% barren. And that's allowing us, allowing us to make selection for fertility, selection for animals that are um, reach puberty earlier and are kind of more fertile going forward. Um, in terms of target weights then, really the key, the key kind of consideration then in terms of top and, man, uh, in terms of top and new hogs, it's really about managing to, to achieve sufficient growth, sufficient maturity to then go on and, and do a good job as, as a breeding new hog. Um, and there's been a lot of research on this and they've kind of come down to a target topping weight of about 60% of mature weight. So if we consider that for a 70 kilogram ewe, we're going to follow that weight on um, through into the next few uh, presentations. That you'd be then be looking at topping that ewe hog at about 42 kilograms. So if we consider for an April lambing flock, you basically need to get all your ewe lambs that you're going to top to a fat lamb weight by November. So that definitely does take a bit more kind of priority feeding and a bit more management to get them to those weights. But you may decide that you only top a selection of your hogs. That might be one consideration. You then are kind of aiming for a target of getting them on a, a kind of consistent growth and um, on a good growth at the beginning that you can get into about 75, 80% of, uh, of their mature weight at lambing. So that again does require a bit more management through the winter to achieve that. When we consider that if you were just growing them on to top as, as gimmers, you'd only be targeting about 80% of mature weight at that point. So definitely more management and more, you know, kind of management input to achieve this. Um, and why do we want those target weights? Well, if we have hogs that are lower weight, they are ultimately less mature. So it's not just about age. It isn't just age that influences maturity. It's also weight. It's the proportion of, of adult weight when an animal comes into puberty. And what we'll see then is higher barren rates in ewe lambs that are less mature. Ultimately, if we've got lambs that are less well grown, we're going to have lower pelvic, so more pelvic sizes, and we're going to have increased issues with lambing difficulties. And that in turn, you know, leads to a lot of management issues, particularly if we're outdoor lambing, but also issues in terms of causing trauma to the offspring and, you know, increased uh, offspring mortality, but also mortality in the ewe hogs. And in the next couple of slides, we'll speak about less mature, less well-grown hogs are going to produce lighter lambs. That puts the whole system into kind of question, is it cost effective then to top these hogs with increased costs if we are not getting a good output from them? And finally, um, we've also got to consider if they're lighter topping at ewe hogs, there's probably less chance of them being meeting target weight as gimmers as well. And if we have a subsequent impact on our gimmer performance, it again makes you, know, makes you question whether the, kind of the, the, the process is, is worthwhile. So I'll just take you through a few slides um, from the HDB Challenge Sheep Project, which is still ongoing. Um, it's a seven year project on 13 farms um, in which they are kind of fully performance recording, fully monitoring 6,000 ewes from birth right through their productive lifespan. So it's a really exciting project and, and showing up a lot of interesting uh, material out of it. And a key one then, if we're looking at, they've kind of separated out the stock then within those farms that are either topped at above target weight, so they're above 60% of mature weight of topping, versus those that are below target. And the difference is really, really stark. So what you're seeing there is 100-day lamb weights 
generally with them all rearing one lamb. So that, that's an individual lamb weight. And what we're seeing then is that those that are above target are actually capable, and this is an average weight of achieving pretty heavy lambs at weaning weight. You know, that would really be worthwhile. That's kind of in current prices, maybe a 60 pound lamb um, of you know, weights sort of 31.2 kilograms. But adversely, if we're not hitting those targets, um, it really can be a bit of a disaster. And you can end up with these lambs that are you know, well under 20 kilograms and then really a kind of uh, fairly unproductive, fairly kind of valueless lamb. Um, so it really just highlights there that we really do need to, you know, meet these targets to make it worthwhile. And likewise, uh, if we look at scanning, so again, scanning is essentially your, your lambing weight. So hitting that 75% of mature weight at lambing, um, or in this case, scanning, hitting that target again, is going to be conducive to achieving that 31 kilogram weaning weight of lamb. However, again, if we do not achieve that kind of good growth from, you know, continued growth from topping through to, to lambing, Again, we're going to see poor performing lambs, and it kind of puts the whole question, the whole thing to kind of question. Likewise, um, this is again data now for the gimmers. What they've really found is that not hitting those target weights as a gimmer. So this, in this case, we're looking at scanning. But likewise for topping, if they're underweight, they're not hitting that 80% weight at topping. They then go on to produce lambs that are of lower weight, and the weights we can see here are combined weaning weights, the weight of one or two lambs combined. Um, and what we're seeing is below target lambs, uh, sorry, low target gimmers are rearing lambs, a total weight of lamb of about 11% less. Adversely, if we see the above target weight actually really pushing the, you know, pushing the barrier of the weights on them, getting well-grown gimmers is going to maybe potentially give you another additional 11% change. They're probably almost, almost mature weight at that point. Um, and ultimately, the difference between the, the above and the below is a, a fairly substantial 7.9 kilograms. Um, which have a big impact on your profitability. So in terms of pre-topping considerations, I suppose one of the big questions you're thinking about topping new lambs is, am I going to have lambs at weight to top? Am I going to hit those target weights? Um, and if we take an example, um, we're, you know, we're targeting, this is for a 70 kilogram mature weight. We're targeting a minimum weight, then a 42 kilograms uh, for topping, say in this case in mid-November. Say we're at mid-August, and we've got our ewe hogs, our ewe lambs are sitting about 28 kilograms average. So they've got 12 weeks to go and they're gonna to have to gain 14 kilos. Then we know that they're gonna to have to gain a minimum of 100 and, uh, 160 grams a day. But realistically, you've always got a spread in weight. So you've got light lambs as well. So realistically, we need to go for a higher target than that. Otherwise the bottom half aren't gonna make it. Um, so realistic, we're looking at a target growth rate of 100, 200 grams a day which does, you know, does involve a bit more priority feeding. You know, they do need to be on good growth, uh, sorry, on good pasture to achieve that. So they will need a bit more priority graze in terms of how we manage them. And at the end of the day, we really can't kind of manage what we don't measure. So it's important to do regular weights to make sure throughout that period of growth over that 12 weeks that they're sustaining that growth and, and, and managing your feeding system, but also potentially things like your worm control to make sure that you're going to meet that target and then ultimately go on to have well-performing hogs. Um, and by weighing as well, we can separate groups. You know, we can put lighter lambs into groups and give them pri even priority feeding over the other ewe hogs. Um, I did find an interesting um, sort of statistic as well in that they'd found that hog, uh, sorry, ewe lambs that were pushed up to puberty, so achieving kind of excessive growth rates of say 300 grams, actually can go on to have uh, reduced other development. And that's to do with high energy levels impacting hormonal levels as well. And in this study, they found a 10 to 17% lower milk yield um, in subsequent lactations as an adult ewe. So really what we're looking for in our ewe hogs is a steady growth rate, ideally off pasture, and avoiding that excessive, you know, excessive feeding. So they've got a steady growth and more natural growth on these animals. But obviously, there's going to be a lot more considerations whether we can just get them to that point in November. Um, so, you know, first off, we're thinking I would be on track for mating. But also, have we got sufficient quality and quality of forage to get them there? So what feeds, you know, haven't kind of taken stock of your feed on the farm? What quality of pastures have you got? What's your ability to, to manage that differently? And what other feeds might you have, for example, forage crops as well for other stock? And ultimately, how is our decision to breed these ewe hogs and give them some priority? How is that going to impact other stocks? You do need to consider your priorities in terms of, you know, you've got finishing lambs on the farm. What's the impact of having to sell them in the store? What is your ability to put condition on your, you know, on your, on your use and meeting your, you know, your target 3.5 body condition score and your use at topping? 
and ultimately re uh, continuing a kind of cheaper grass-based system on those ewes as well. So is there any impact on the winter feed costs? And if so, that might put into question what, you know, whether you breed your hogs or not. So it's really about taking stock and kind of considering feed budgeting and considering really where you are. Um, and again, you know, do I have the feed resources to winter the shoe hogs to target weight? So can I achieve a good growth rate, which we'll talk about in a minute? And these lambs are needing sort of, sort of the ewe hogs that are in pregnancy, but also subsequent in lactation. They're needing about 20% more than, uh, than a ewe rearing the similar or, or bearing a similar number of litter size. Um, so they are needing kind of priority pasture. So what's our ability to do a good job with them again, um, also during lactation? And we've got a webinar on that, which I'll, which I'll share later on. In terms of pregnancy targets, well, as I said, you know, we're looking at about 20% more energy than a mature ewe bearing the same number of lambs. And ultimately, if we're going to get them from sort of that 42 kilograms post tuppen to over 50 kilograms, you know, almost, you know, 56 kilograms by the time she's lambing down, we're looking at about 100, gra 100 grams average day live weight gain. And that might sound quite doable, but we do not want to achieve that on average because what we know is in the last six weeks, um, if we overfeed her, if we were feeding her to, for example, 100 grams a day, what she'll then do is not convert that uh, en additional energy you're giving her into growth of herself. She'll just put that into the lamb and we'll end up with a situation which a lot of people do with hogs where they've got overfed ewe lambs that have large lamb weights and ultimately issues with dystocia and, and lamb mortality. So we really want to avoid, we want to have them on maintenance in the last six weeks, which means at the beginning of that pregnancy, we're looking for a kind of higher growth rate of about 200 grams a day. And we're going to drop that down after six weeks to about 150. And we'll sustain that from about seven to about week 15, then going down to maintenance. And at that point, you'll be feeding them similar to what you'll be feeding your ewes. Um, again, um, another interesting kind of uh, statistic that I found um, is that they found that high growth rates in the first intervening sort of six weeks of 300 grams a day, so kind of playing catch up to achieve weights in the initial stages, can actually lead to poorer placental development, which ultimately can lead to lower lamb birth weights and poorer lamb survival. And the, the kind of the adverse is also true on poor growth rates. So we're really just trying to get that sustained good performance in those hogs early. And we can do that off, off pasture. Um, just a kind of example um, of how, how winter feeding might go down. If we consider we've got our 42 kilogram lambs or, or over that, and we're trying to get them to grow about 200 grams a day in the first six weeks, they're gonna need about 16 megajoules of energy. And we're gonna drop that down to a lower growth rate and they're still gonna need about 12 to 14. But if we can manage our pasture well enough that we've got good quality pasture in front of them, of say 11 ME and a, a, and a ewe lamb of over 40 kilograms can consume about one, one and a half kilograms of dry matter. They are capable of achieving that growth rate off pasture only. But again, only if we manage that quality pasture and down on the right hand side here, we can see kind of pasture, kind of a suggested pasture quality depending. And we can certainly see that if we're in that right hand side, we're gonna be in no way have the ability to, to meet off, off pasture. But perhaps we're more to the left hand side or in the middle, we can have a potential there to, to meet their demands just off pasture. But particularly given that you're, you know, you are put these lands in pregnancy, we need to consider also whether we need to supplement. And although it's probably quite trendy to look for kind of pasture only systems, there really is no harm. I wouldn't be afraid to kind of supplement a little bit, even 200 grams a day, just to supplement that, that pasture quality and get those hogs well growing, because that really is going to pay in the end in, in subsequent land performance. And just a kind of last couple of points then um, on tops and teasers. Again, it's just absolutely essential really in a, in a hog system, even more so if you're outdoor lambing, that these, these hogs do lamb unassisted. Um, we need to consider breeds um, that are ultimately easier lambing. But we've also got EBVs to help us as well in, in a variety of breeds. And what I'd be selecting for there in both cases would be low birth weight type animals, be that maternal, or there are certain terminal breeds or within, within a breed that I'd be selecting for, I'd certainly be looking at lower birth weight and also ease of lambing as well. So a lot of people talk with that kind of wedge shaped top where he's not so extreme at the shoulders and at the head and um, just for that bit of easier lambing, it really does pay to do that. Um, you might also consider using experienced tops as well as it is known that you lambs will kind of exhibit less aggressive estrus behavior. They have a shorter estrus and they also kind of seek around that a little bit less 
um, so it can help having experienced tops. Um, and there's a kind of recommended idea that you maybe put one to 40. Um, another consideration as well that you might have is whether to use a teaser just to try and get those tops, uh, those ewe lambs cycling, to try and have a compact lambing in those hogs to kind of minimize labor requirements really. Um, you might use the teaser about one to 80. And there's several different approaches to how you use a teaser. Some people put them in for, for you know, many, many weeks. But there is kind of there is some research that would show that if you put them in for a short duration, just 14 days, so two weeks pre-tupping, this can have a kind of synchronizing effect um, on those ewe lambs. Um, and it can pull their first cycle into sort of 10 days once the entire ram goes in. So if you add another 17 days on that for one more cycle, you can do two cycles in a few days less in about, about 27 days. Um, and that'll all just help condense your lamin and all that kind of thing. Um, so that's just a few considerations. But again, you hogs, huge potential to have improved production, improved profitability in the sheep system, but it definitely takes that bit more management and they do take a bit more priority feeding and they do need to be monitored in terms of growth to get them to those target weights. So 60% of topping, 75% of lamin and growing on to 80% um, by the time they're topping as a, as a, um, as a gimmer. So I will now pass you over to Poppy Freer. Thanks for that, Daniel. Uh, one moment, I will just share my screen. Fantastic. Hopefully that's sharing okay. Perfect. Good to go. Great. Okay, so we discussed ewes last week. Excuse me. Uh, we discussed, Daniel's nicely discussed the ewe lambs for those that are considering mating them this year. And tups, and now we move on to, yes, the bottom of the ranks for this time of the year, um, is the the grazing grazing lambs for productive flocks. But just to kind of again set, um, the lambs within the 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 flock management perspective, why getting them away so quickly is important to the flock management, and um, this sort of lamb age at slaughter is certainly a key performance indicator for. For profitable flocks and um, when I say the target is less than 150 days and so less than five months and the reason being really is is this graph here is this strain on the resources on the farm so flocks are great in terms of utilizing this nice um grass growth I put it as an average obviously this year has been very extreme compared to normal years but this average grass growth that we try and manage um with good grazing management, we try and manage this variability year to year. Um, and flocks are good at this because with the way the, the U works in terms of through the winter months, we're trying to just keep that capital stock, the, the breeding flock um, through the winter months. And then with the, the amount of lambs they produce, we're trying to capitalize on this great grass growth through the summer months. Um, so, by managing the breeding flocks optimally, making sure we've got the, the number levels right for the farm resources that the farm resources can handle, um, and making sure we get a decent lamb crop to utilize this summer grass growth, um, and then offloading, getting rid of those lambs as quickly as possible to ensure that we can reprioritize as we are at this time of year on the breeding ewe or ewe lambs or as tups, as, as Daniel mentioned, reprioritize back on the breeding flock to get those numbers again next year. So lamb age at slaughter is a key performance indicator, not just because we want that cash flow, because we want that high product price, which to be fair, not many of us do get in May and June time. It really is to make sure that we can prioritize resources again on the breeding ewe flock. Um, and I've put down here, perhaps controversially, but only understocked farms can cope with keeping the bulks, bulk of lambs past November on homegrown forage. So nutritional factors affecting lamb growth. Before they reach eight weeks old, it's subtly different from those uh, post eight weeks old, because before they reach eight weeks old, the majority of the nutrition is coming from ewe milk. So therefore it's the, the management of the ewe. So, the use condition, as I discussed in great detail last week, uh, and the quantity and the quality of the forage to the ewe um, pre eight week old to determine her milking ability, which determines the lamb growth rates. I specify nutritional factors, of course, there are genetic factors that will influence that as well. 
Um, post eight week old, however, um, it goes in this sort of order of priority. The forage quality and quantity in front of them, first and foremost. Um, gut worms alongside that. If you think about it, if they've got good forage quality, if they've got good nutrition, and if they're not being great, forced to graze too tight, they're going to be less susceptible to gut worms. So getting this number one right will, will help influence their susceptibility to gut worms. Um, and in addition, as I'll talk later, um, having a diversity of forage in the sward, again, reduces their susceptibility to gut worms. And then finally, trace elements come in at, at number three there. All too often, I see people going straight, jumping straight to trace elements as being the problem, as being something I need to look at when these two elements aren't, aren't correct. I would say there's a lot to be gained from getting, getting number one right. So we've talked sward height targets um, going in eight to 10 centimetres and I've put in bold and I've made it that bit bigger. If there's nothing else you take away from this presentation is lambs should not, high performing stock should not be forced to graze, be grazed in below five centimetres. Okay, um, that's not conducive always to keeping a nice pristine sward into the future. However, if we want an animal performance, they shouldn't be grazing lower than five centimetres. Um, in a set stop situation, again, can be absolutely fine. Um, keeping the, the grass within that six to eight centimetre mark um, will be the best for animal performance. Okay. And this is when that leader follower um, situation can come in quite in handy because then you can have those tidying up and um, making sure they graze to that nice three to four centimetre mark. And by doing that, then the quality is maintained in the future. It's such a tricky balance, but first and foremost, animal performance is your most important, not keeping a pristine pasture. It's animal performance. Don't graze them too low, long, low if you want them to be growing well. I think this is a really nice graph. It's taken from quite an old document, a 400 plus of the premises achieving over 400 grams a day lamb growth rates in your, um, in your lambs. Um, and it comes from Beef and Lamb New Zealand. And you can see how the energy value of the diet influences the potential live weight gain, all other things being equal. So you can see um, along the bottom here, what sort of feeds result in what sort of energy of the diet and what sort of live weight gain we can hope for. I think what stands out for me here is that new milk is often the highest energy feed a lamb gets, it's at about 13 ME. So maximizing their performance through lactation, uh, particularly when the lambs are smaller, their feed conversion efficiency is better. Maximizing that performance is often um, takes you a long way to achieving that um, days to slaughter target. You can see the mostly clover pasture in this sort of, uh, well, 11, and a, 11 to 12 ME mark. Um, and the, the growth rates that we can expect on a mostly clover pasture, it's a season average. You can tell this is a New Zealand document because they talk about lucerne. It's been talked about a bit here, yeah, but lucerne needs quite dry soils, quite well-drained soils. Um, and and other, other feed, sweets and turnips, rape and pasture, which is another a hybrid that's used over there, rape kale hybrid. Um, for average ryegrass and clover, it's around the sort of 10 to 11 ME mark. So we can expect these sort of growth rates. And then you can see as the, the quality of the pasture reduces, 50% so stem or dead with little clover, something around 9 ME, the lambs stand still. And then it's all dead and all stem, they go backwards. So if nothing else, that just shows you um, how the stem and dead material affects the, the lamb performance. We've seen this image before, but just to, to highlight, this is where the, the leader follower really does benefit um, the pasture quality, but also the lamb performance. There's really is a benefit to that. And post weaning, it, it might be the fit use following the lambs that can work really nicely. 
Other sort of land finishing crop options, which have been talked about more and more, um, are these sort of multi-species swords. This is a new technical note available um, that Daniel's just recently produced. Um, so it's available online. Things like red clover, this is chicory, uh, plantain, but where I've showed them in just for, for ease in as straights here, they work really well as a mix. Um, other things included, like a species included things like bird's foot trefoil, um, yarrow, you know, a diversity of the mix. We talk about diversity as being good to be resilient to weather, being good for soil health. Um, in the context of lamp finishing, there's lots of evidence to show the benefits to lamp performance, just to showcase one um, graph. This is taken from um, a fantastic piece of work called Smart Grass over an island led by University College Dublin. Um, and what they did was they showed the benefit of um, so perennial ryegrass, perennial ryegrass plus white clover versus a six species mix versus a nine spe species mix to the lamb weaning weights. So they found that compared to perennial ryegrass, lambs uh, suckling used with the six species sword had a 2.4 kilo higher live weight at weaning. So that's just one bit of the, the research that they found, the, the notes that I just pointed to pre previously, um, also summarize some of the other evidence that they've, the re results that they found in terms of reduced nitrogen requirement, in terms of reduced anthermintic uh, requirement, in, in, and also in terms of indicators of soil health as well. Um, interestingly, um, sorry, I don't know the data enough to, to understand why the nine species mix wasn't quite such as a good level as of um, weaning weight, but the mixes basically um, show a better performance compared to a standard perennial ryegrass and uh, the perennial ryegrass plus white clover. Now, one of the challenges with these mixes, particularly in Scotland, is maintaining that diversity over a long period of time. Um, we often find that keeping chicory in, um, in the sward is quite challenging beyond three years, um, even beyond two years, it can be quite hard to keep in the sward. The plantains um, varieties that are in these mixes don't tend not to be very frost tolerant, so they can die if they get a, a hard frost. Um, however, some think that the, the cost of these mixes can be justified based on the, the benefit that we get in the lamb growth rates in the first two years. And then you're left with perhaps a ryegrass clover sward, maybe that's okay. So I just thought I would do a cost benefit of that just to understand that concept a bit further. Now, of course, there are other benefits to multi-species swords like the, the resilience in forage production, as I discussed, and also fertilizer and also anthermintics, but just in the, the frame of the lamb growth benefits, you can see how a cost benefit over two years, um, according to the seed mix, so from 50 to 300 pounds, which I did hear quoted, albeit on an organic farm, albeit in England, um, 300 pounds per hectare has been quoted to people. Um, and the land growth benefit, so from 10 to 150 grams a day. So you can see um, really anything sort of, I would say 150 pounds per hectare over that probably isn't justifiable on this basis. Okay, probably isn't justifiable on the basis of land growth rates um, over two years. Of course, over three years, it looks a little bit more cost effective again, but maintaining that persistency can be challenging in Scotland. And this is based on 15 years and twin lambs to the hectare and a baseline growth rate of 200 grams a day. Um, and like I say, 250 to 300 grams is possible on these type of mixes. So uh, this, this 100 grams is possible. Um, and like I say, so 150, perhaps maybe 200, you might, you might be tempted to move to, but anything above that probably isn't worthwhile. That said, this baseline growth I put in here, 200 grams a day, that is important to this analysis. Um, if you're already growing uh, much above that, you know, for this 
for even at 80 grams a day benefit uh, a lower stocking rate um you know if you're already growing a lot lot above that anyways and some of you might just be on good red clover ryegrass swords you know that 300 grams a day is possible without going to the extent of having all these nice um additional species within the mix again it, it makes that that cost benefit less attractive again if you've already got quite high growth rates as a baseline um and that brings me to my next point is understanding your baseline so daniel mentioned weighing the new lambs and i know it's seen as quite um and it is quite um, a laborious task weighing all the lambs so we have devised um, a, me a method just to weigh a sample of the lambs um, and it can be as, sm as small as, um, you know, ideally sort of about 50, 50 lambs in a, in a group and making sure that you weigh a, a sample, a random selection rather than just picking the heaviest or the lightest and fooling yourself. So weighing a random selection. So I've just stepped out a bit of the, the methods here, try to weigh in logical groups and that provide a relatively uniform mob. Um, weigh at the same time of grass to limit the effect of, of gut fill. So ideally, that should be weighed straight off the field. Uh, check the scales are accurate, of course. Um, and for mobs of an even weight and size, a minimum of 36, ideally 56. And what you do is you de deduct the heaviest three and the lightest three. So you take an average of the 50. So this, the results aren't distorted. Um, and if they're even more uneven, and you might need to take a greater sample. And, and then weighing a random selection. So an equal sample from the front, middle and back of the mob, or say weighing, I don't know, for instance, every third lamb through, um, through, the, through the handling system. So just to try and make it a bit more practical, when you've got lambs in for dozing or for drafting, just taking the time just to, to weigh a sample of them to understand what the growth rates are, what your baseline is, uh, if you're on a forage crop, what, what the growth benefit is on that crop as well. Just to understand management and, and whether it needs tweaking and whether it needs improving. And I would say weighing at eight weeks, because like I say, weighing at eight weeks helps me understand the new management um, and the lactation management and how that's coming out in my lamb growth rates. It's also, of course, um, it helps me understand the direct lamb growth genetics there. And the maternal genetics there. Um, weighing again at, at 14 weeks, it's kind of like a standard uh, time to weigh um, for weaning time. So around the 100 day mark. And then weighing the sample at re regular intervals post weaning. It's all bits of information that helps me refine the management. Um, you know, if I've got the, the forage quality and quantity looking really good and they're still not gaining as I'd expect. Then, then I'll start looking into the detail of, of the trace elements um, and, other, and the genetics and other aspects to make sure that I'm continually improving to get those lamb growth, growth rates looking good. Um, so what should the targets be? So in that eight week period, it sh they should be targeting at least 320 grams a day. That's when they're most efficient. And that's what really does set the scene to make sure they um, you get them off farm as quickly as possible. In the next period, up until weaning time, the target should be 240 grams a day. Okay, when they're milking, they're doing the best. When they're off milk, they're doing the best. So over this entire period, the, the target should be over 280 grams a day to achieve that average 30 kilos at weaning, at least. And post weaning, it gets that bit more challenging. On sort of pasture, for example, after mass, they should be doing over 150 grams a day. Um, on good new reseeds with high percentage of white clover um, or cleaner pasture, over 180 grams a day. And then on forage rate, turnips, hybrids, plantain and chicory sorts, over 200 grams a day. Um, and then the best stuff is, is this red clover where they can be doing over 300 grams a day. Or of course, if they're being creep fed, they should be doing over 300 grams a day to make that justifiable. 
So from birth to sale, the target should be at least 250 grams a day for spring lambing flocks, aiming to finish most of the lambs off pasture. So without weighing, we don't know how well we're performing according to target. So aside from grass, other options are out there as the, the forage rape or stubble turnips. So I've just put a bit of a guide. Well, this is from the, the Forage First Sheep Systems Guide uh, in terms of what sort of yield we can expect from these type of crops. And as a consequence, based on lamb demand, what sort of hectareage would be required for 100 lambs. So from forage rape and stubble turnips, two hectares to 100 lambs, um, whereas on high yielding crops such as Swedes, 1.1 hectares to 100 lambs. When you can start grazing, and different aspects to, to watch for. So for these ones with, with rape or rape kale hybrids, that's where photosensitization can be problematic, particularly grazed during the, the summer months, well, late summer months. Um, and that's when they uh, they get sort of sunburn in, the, in their ears, crispy ears, and, and they can, you know, it can be really detrimental to their performance, but also can um, be quite uh, fatal to them. So watching out for that and removing them off the crop. If that is a problem, um, the darker faced lambs are less susceptible to this problem. Um, in terms of these hybrids, multiple grazing is possible, um, which can be beneficial to that yield. Um, so if some of the leaf is left it, and it's rotation you graze, you can go back to that crop um, two or three times. And then in terms of Swedes, which is often in this, the winter months, making sure they've got that grass run back somewhere they can lie, the shelter ideally. And as I said last week, always having these plan B options. Yes, this is a really cost effective um, way to, to winter finish lambs, um, but it's, it's only cost effective if we keep that, that plan B in place and we don't lose them. I mentioned worms, but obviously I'm, I'm not a vet, so I'm not going to talk too much about worms. And also it would be a webinar in itself. But in terms of worms and grazing, um, an ideal scenario is where you can do this cleaner grazing. We're moving away from the phrase clean grazing entirely because um, having pristine, clean, a pasture free of, free of eggs is really unlikely on a sheep farm. Um, but cleaner grazing is possible. And I've borrowed this map from uh, Barnside Farm, although they have moved away from this for other reasons. Um, but they were doing a really nice example of cleaner grazing um, where they had, um, well, this block might have been the, the, they had basically three blocks of the farm um, of um, largely equal sort of size. And they moved the stock between the blocks. So Say in year one, the year and lamb using lambs might be on this block, and then in year two, uh, that might have been a silage block, then followed by wean lambs, and then year three it would be cattle or silage. So the 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 stock could be kept separate within the year, and then they're moved. So it's fantastic because not only do the ewes and lambs not graze um, a block where it being grazed by ewes and lambs the year. Prior, prior to that, but also the weaned lambs will be moved on to silage ground, which hadn't been grazed for two years. So, so it meant that the, the worm egg burden was, was really low. Say so this was the silage ground, the, the worm egg burden would be really low on that ground. So that was a really, really nice example. And it requires you to have roughly one, one cow to six ewes which relates to roughly equal um, feed demand from the cattle and the sheep. And yes, trace elements do play a part. Um, and most of the time when it comes to growing lambs, it's this trace element, it's cobalt. Um, and that's highly relevant to Scotland. There is a technical note um, on cobalt and grass and soils also available online. And it shows this lovely graph, which shows most of the soils in Scotland being deficient, um, of high risk of cobalt deficiency. Um, 
So cobalt is often very influential to lamb growth rates, particularly as they reduce their milk intake. Um, so it can become an increasing problem post eight weeks. How to understand that? Soil type tests can help, forage tests can help, blood tests um, help determine uh, probably to the greatest level of accuracy because it tells you what's going on within the animal. And even better than that is things like liver tests because that's where cobalt is stored within the animal. But of course, then they're, they're not always practical to get. Um, but cobalt is, is definitely something which impacts their performance and using drenches can help, using boluses can help. And there was um, a, a smart shot injection that was a long acting injection, which was also very beneficial to their growth rates too. So I've discussed lambs within the context of the flock, but at this time of the year, the question is whether question on many people's minds might be whether offloading lambs is the priority. Do I need to destock? And I would say that depends on the grass covers. So what feed you have available in grass on the farm. It depends on the ewe condition, as I discussed last week, and it can be, depends on your area available. So I've stepped out a bit of a feed budget here just to help reinforce that point. So if I was to measure grass today on the farm using so the QMS style sword stick, which helps me convert the centimeters of grass into the kilos of dry matter, so I can start quantifying it like a feed. Um, so if I was to measure the grass today and it told me I've got 2,200 kilos of dry matter per hectare as an average across the farm. As a target for topping time, I want 2,000 at least. Um, as we know that that grass cover through topping time, the, the golden 20 days is very influential to the scanning percentage that I might expect. If I was to estimate grass growth and be quite conservative over the next sort of couple of uh, next six weeks or so, it'd be 10 kilos um, of dry matter per hectare per day. If I want, if you want to sort of look at the sort of information, Grass Check GB is a really good website which um, which does update on a on a weekly basis what the grass growth is, and you can look at what this looks like in your area if you find the farm nearest to yourself. Um, I'll look at the days to tapping, so making sure that um, I'm factoring in how much time I've got until tapping time and, and the utilisation. So with those bits of information, I've got 200 kilos of dry matter here. I've got my growth rate, so 10 times 30. So that gives me a total of 500 kilos of dry matter per hectare times by my utilisation, which is an estimate, um, gives me 350 kilos of dry matter available pasture. Okay, hopefully that makes some sense. That's me trying to quantify it per hectare, what feed I've got in pasture. Now you can see how the flock condition influences the demand. So my average ewe demand, and I've taken this from AHDB feeding the ewe, um, an average ewe demand if I just wanted to maintain condition, if she's on target, she requires 0 0.84 kilos of dry matter per day. That's a 70 kilo ewe. Um, however, if 50% of the flock need to gain half a condition score, and as I said last week, we're really getting to the point where that's um, becoming less and less under our control. Um, I want them to be on an average of one kilo um, per day. Say if I've got eight hectares, and 100 use the demand per hectare per day, 0 0.84 times 100 divided by eight, my, my hectares available is 10.5 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day demand. Multiply that by, by 30, my days till topping. That's 315 kilos of dry matter per hectare required. So 315 there. And I've got 350 up here. Um, so I know that it's quite tight, um, but it's, it's doable. However, um, just to 
cut a long story short, doing that same equation with those needing to gain half a condition score, I'm going to be exceeding. My demand is exceeding my supply. OK, so it just puts onus on needing to destock so I can refocus on the use. And even at this sort of 100% of the flock on target with 315, there really isn't very much margin there. So it really puts an emphasis on, on the need to destock. Hopefully that makes some sense. What I would say if you were to look at uh, playing around with these figures yourself would be to keep, uh, to measure grass, but keep these figures the same, the 2000, the 10, um, and if you're rotationally grazing in any form, keep this to 70. Um, but but play around with these figures, 220, it, yeah, your cover measurement and your days to tapping. Um, and then uh, looking at these figures, it very much depends on whether you need to gain condition or not. But it'll just help with that decision making. Yes, the store land price might look as good as what's possible. Yes, um, they might not be as heavy as they could be, but getting them on target is going to be more influential to next year's crop. And in terms of other sorts of feed budgets, um, I really I appreciate this gets a bit dry, but um, say, for instance, um, there is some a grazing area available and you want to look at what sort of um, lamb stocking rate you might um, or what sort of grazing days will be available there. So I've got 10 hectares available. Um, my cover measurement is 2,600 kilos. However, I want to keep that cover. So at 2,200, so really it's not really adding to my feed supply. And my estimated grass growth, so this was in August, my estimated grass growth is 40 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day. My rotation length is 24 days. My utilization, I'm putting it up to 80% because they've been rotationally grazed well. So my feed available is 10 hectares multiplied by 40 kilos of dry matter per day times 24, multiplied that by 0 0.8, my 80%. So I can say on that 10 hectares, I've got 7,600, 7.6 tons, sorry, that should be kilos, 7.6 tons of dry matter available. Yeah, sorry, I got my units wrong. So 7.6 tons there. If the lambs are weighing 35 kilos, um, the lamb demand is 4% of their body weight, 1.4 kilos per day. The lamb demand over the grazing period is 33.6 kilos of dry matter per lamb. Therefore, on this 10 hectares, 228 lambs can graze here. Okay. So that's one way in which feed budgeting can help. There are other things I can do, I can look at. So uh, for instance, I might decide I can reduce covers. Maybe the farmer's um, not gonna utilize that bit of land or maybe that bit of land doesn't require, is gonna get a good winter rest period. So I can might say, well, I wanna reduce covers. Um, so my cover measurement might be 2,600, but I can target 1,700 at the end of it. So that gives me an additional 900 kilos there. I might be more realistic about the grass growth at this time of the year. Um, and you can see I've got my 900 kilos from my reducing covers plus the grass growth. Um, again, tells me I've got 7,392 kilos of dry matter, 7.3, 7.4 tons, close to 7.4 tons of dry matter. Um, again, lamb weight, lamb demand being the same. It tells me 220 lambs can graze here. Or I might look at it in a different way. I might say, well, I've got 400 lambs on that 10 hectares. Um, the feed available is 7.2 tons of dry matter. Notice I've not included grass growth here because I want to understand the days uh, available. The lamb weight calculation there. So for lamb, for the group demand, 400 times that 1.4 tells me that group require 560 kilos of dry matter per day. Therefore, my feed available divided by my, my um, group demand tells me I've got 12 days available. However, the, the eagle, the geeky amongst us might say, well, actually, 
then you'll have an additional 12 days of grass growth. So I've added on to give me an extra two days and I can go around in circles, but it gives me a bit of a gauge as to how long that bit of land would last 400 lambs, particularly going into the winter when I have more certainty of the grass growth being very little. So I just wanted to step up a little bit to introduce you to a little bit of uh, feed budgeting. I know it's not um, always the easiest to get your head around, but by quantifying grass as a feed in kilos of dry matter, we can start to, to understand how we can graze that optimally. So just to summarize, um, quantity and quality of forage is really key to uh, lamb growth rates. It's the first priority to achieving good lamb growth rates. Consider, and sell, consider selling light to lambs if feed is tight, the ewes are more important. Um, measuring performance just helps us gauge how well we're doing, where tweaks need to be made. And I've just introduced a little bit of feed budgeting to help assist that decision making to make more from grass.